Hey everyone, before we get into today's show, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Coinbase Prime and Ledger. Love these companies, genuinely proud to call them sponsors of the show. You're going to be hearing all about them later from me, but now on with the program. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of uh, the Weekly Roundup. Uh, I'm joined as always by my intrepid co-host, Mr. Mark Yusko. What's going on, Mark? Oh, I, I like intrepid, Michael. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. I used to give Tyler a different uh, adjective every week, so maybe we can restart I that like trend. that trend. All right. All right. <laughs> I'll have to, I'll have to right. reciprocate, though. So uh, debonair might be the one for today. But, uh... Ooh, debonair. I did do my hair before this. Thank you very much for noticing. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. feel very nice now. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. So we've got a lot of ground to cover, so I just want to get into it uh, this week. Um, and just as a heads up, guys, we're going to be talking, obviously, about the launch of the Bitcoin ETF and everything like that. Uh, but just one quick disclaimer before we get into it. Uh, Mark and I would really uh, value your feedback. Uh, so if you guys are listening to this on YouTube or Apple or Spotify or whatever it is, drop comments, uh, give us a rating and review. Super helpful for us uh, in terms of the content. Um, I'm going to start with this uh, chart, Mark, which is what we're looking at is real uh, per capita GDP versus the pre-2000 trend. Uh, so in case you aren't joining us on video here, Basically, what we're looking at um, is what uh, the pre-2000 trend one, which is 2.2% growth uh, versus what has actually happened uh, since 2000. And you can see the real uh, per capita GDP has significantly lagged that. So at the bottom of this chart, uh, they kind of give you a little bit of a stat, uh, which is that um, U.S. per capita GDP in 2021 is 58,000. But if it had continued to grow at the pre-2000 uh, trend, then it would be uh, 73,000 or 25.6% higher. What are your takeaways when you look at this? Oh, so many things. I, you know, I, I talk about this as, as the killer Ds. So uh, basically, it's, it's demographics. You know, demographics is destiny. Uh, it turns out 65 yeah. to 85-year-old people are not very productive, uh, and they're, they don't spend a lot. <laughs> Doesn't mean they're not perfectly nice people. But demographically, if you look around the world, uh, Japan leads... Uh, they're ahead by 11 years. Uh, so if you go back 11 years from this point to 1989, that was the peak of, of their market. Um, and not surprisingly, our peak happened 11 years later in 2000. In terms of growth, and I'm not, not the exact whole stock market, we were able to engineer through a series of, of central bank actions uh, better stock market stuff. I don't like that light shine in my eyes. So, and I apologize for the just bad graphics today for me. Although I do have a face for radio, so maybe this is good to be kind of dark. But uh, we're up in great, South Bend for the great. game, and and uh, but anyway. So demographically, uh, there's just too many people turning 65, 10,000 people every single day for the next 17 years, and and so that's the first thing is is growth has to slow when your population ages, and and then the flip side of that is you get a, uh, a gap uh, from you know, the baby boomers, which caused the great growth uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, et cetera, uh, when they came back from the war. They have kids, and so we have the echo boom, you know, the millennials and the Gen Zs, but they're, they're 25 to 45. And 25 to 45 aren't very productive and don't spend a lot because they don't have a lot yet. Uh, in most cases, not every, I mean, they're plenty of 25-year-olds who become rich, um, but on average, those two cohorts are not really highly productive and highly spending, and therefore GDP tends to lag. So if you look around the world, right, the high GDP countries have very uh, high working age population growth populations, people in their you know, 40s and 50s, and shouldn't be surprising. Now, the other part of this is debt. So debt creates this illusion of growth and really starting in the 70s when we untethered from gold and created what I refer to online as the you know hashtag fiat fiasco, uh, we have been in a declining growth trend because we are weakening the dollar by increasing the amount of, of debt burden. And it was, when you have no debt and you borrow, it actually adds value. You know, think of think of paying cash for a house and the price goes up 10%, you only make 10%. If you borrow half the money, price goes up 10%, you make 20%. So there is actually some benefit to the use of debt prudently. But as countries become super indebted, you know, Japan reached more than 100% debt to GDP back in that that 1989 period. 
basically since then they've been moribund, right? They've had no GDP growth to speak of, uh, no CPI, uh, no inflation. They've been stuck in this deflationary death spiral. And all of that leads to deflation. So the killer Ds are demographics, debt, and deflation. And that's exactly what we're seeing here for the US, yeah. just 11 years after Japan. And it's gonna go on for another couple of decades. If you, if you plotted the working age population growth, it'd be the exact opposite, right? It'd be a declining line. Uh, and there's just no way you can grow fast if the number of people who are in that, that perfect zone of working age population are declining, just can't happen. You were one of the first people that highlighted just the importance of demographics in general, which I think that's still the strongest counter argument to the secular inflation narrative. Um, and the reason that I wanted to start with this chart today, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about inflation later. Uh, but one thing that's always missing from the inflation argument to me is this idea of growth and lower structural growth. Um, so I, I don't know if you've been listening to Andrew Yang has been doing the, the podcast circuit recently. And he has this great phrase, as all politicians do, right? Which is just, if everyone behaves according to their incentives, that we're all super fucked. <laughs> um, and, and my interpretation of that is, you know, I actually think a lot of what we're seeing right now is the rollover um, of really good government-led policies that began in the 40s and 50s and like the whole beginning of the baby boomer uh, generation. Yeah. Like if you look at a lot of the, the policies that came into place post-World War II, right? You had the GI Bill, largest transfer of wealth, um, certainly was for a long period of time in human history, they had all these great uh, benefits to basically say thank you to the soldiers so they gave, um, or people that fought, so they gave, uh, you know, essentially free money in the form of subsidized education, mortgage, and access mm -hmm. to capital. That led to a huge boom in population. And what we're kind of seeing is the rollover of it's literally, you know, it's 80 years later. Um, and to your point yeah. about demographics, that's a huge structural drag on growth. So central bankers are performing according to their incentives. Uh, we as a society don't accept uh, when the growth trends just slow down. Uh, so they're printing money to kind of make up the difference. And the result is that's where we're at today. Well, it's money uh, illusion. Kind of I mean, Michael, yeah. this is the whole problem, right? Is, you know, we had the worst decade of economic growth in history. In the history yep. of the Republic, the last decade, you know, despite the fact that the previous presidents, all of them, both sides, we're claiming that it was the greatest economy ever. It was the worst decade of economic growth in history. And that, that includes, the crazy part is that includes the, the depression, right? I mean, it just, mm -hmm. uh, because we had such a That's snapback nuts. after the depression. Uh, and and may, look, maybe we'll have a big snapback on the other side of, of this great recession. I, I don't see it. In fact, I see the exact opposite. I think we're, we're headed for close to zero growth. Ah, look at that. You anticipated that point. Um, mm. You know, hope springs eternal. The blue line here is is comical, right? It's like everybody's like, oh, you know, it's 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 great. And COVID was awesome and the lockdowns. And, and now see, we're spending all this money and we're going to, oh, the green line is, is the harsh reality, which is mm -hmm. we're a year away from the stimulus packages. And there doesn't seem to be a whole lot more of free money. Uh, you know, they're going to try to hand out free money to their friends and cronies through the infrastructure bill. But that isn't going to trickle down. You know, the whole idea of trickle down economics that Reagan used to talk about uh, is, is kind of comical, right? It's trickle up economics. The people who benefit are the friends of the cronies or the cronies of, of the, the politicians. And that has been true for the last century and it's gotten worse and worse and worse. And this green line is, is proof statement of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, certainly not a rosy picture here. Uh, and you know, it, it's funny about listening to experts and economists in general. And my framework for economists is just that they are trying to, they're really smart people with good intentions, but yes. they are trying to make predictions about one of the most complex systems that exists, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, financial markets, global financial markets, um, with the worst set of data of all time. So you just kind of have to look at it through the framework. They're smart people. Uh, it's their frameworks, I think, are better than nothing, but you just shouldn't take anything mm -hmm. as gospel. So, you know, back then when there was this blue chip consensus about growth, it's like you should just take that with a gigantic grain of salt because look at where we are. And, you know, and it took you should what, also uh, consider you know, the two months. Right. You know, like you said, incentives. What, what are the incentives of right blue chip economists, right? Blue chip economists mm -hmm. by their very name are employed by big 
financial services companies uh, to promote a, a rosy picture, I hate to say it, uh, mm -hmm. so that they can underwrite new deals and, and, and encourage capital spending. And, and, and again, I, I agree with you. I don't think people are malintended. I, I really, and I think they are very smart. But here's the thing. You know how many times the Fed has actually been right on their forecast of GDP? <laughs> zero. Yeah. There's yeah. zero for 234, about to be 235. How is that possible? I mean, it's full of PhDs and people with way bigger yeah. brains than, than I'll ever have. And I, I don't sit here and try to forecast GDP because I think it's a fool's game. To your point, it's a highly complex adaptive system and it's reflexive. Just when you think you understand it, something starts impacting it in the opposite way that you don't see or understand. Um, and, it, and it surprises both on the upside and the downside. So kind of crazy. Yeah, that's pretty nuts. I, I used to have a question for you. I, I admit, I, so I was listening to, uh, before we recorded today, uh, the episode of Macro Voices with Luke Roman. He's been talking a lot about uh, entitlement spending uh, as well. Yep. So he's kind of got this, yep. um, I was looking for the chart. I couldn't get it up here in time. Uh, but credit to Luke and Eric uh, for producing this episode. He talked about basically treasury. So he was looking at treasury spending uh, plus whatever we owe for entitlements, which is going up. You know, there was uh, on Social Security, there was a plus 5.9% increase uh, based on cost of living adjustments, uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you look at treasury spending plus, um, you know, whatever we owe for entitlements, and he compared that to tax receipts. And that number, essentially what we're spending, uh, so real interest, uh, is like 120% of tax receipts, uh, which he viewed as being really inflationary. I, I got I to gotta admit, I, I don't really fully understand the entitlements uh, thing. Maybe it's just because I'm so far away from reaping any of those entitlements in my <laughs> personal life and that I haven't paid a lot of attention yeah. to it. Um, but do you know what they're kind of talking about there or have any insight um, in terms of you know what Luke might be pointing out? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, an entitlement, you know, the the mm. the definition is it's a promise that you make to yourself that you don't fund and you ask your kids to pay for, right? I mean, that's what Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and it's it's basically the things that that were dreamt up again back in the '30s, post um, the the Depression, that said, hey, we, we need to take care of our populace, particularly our populace in, in old age. So they, they came with these ideas. And look, at the time, it was actually a pretty good idea. Like Social Security um, was, you know, you retired at, at age 65. Now, the life expectancy back then was 58. So it's a pretty good deal. They weren't going to have to pay. So, hey, if you make it 65, we'll take care of you. Uh, and, and there were 17 workers for every retiree. So there were a lot of people paying into the system. But the problem is we, we ran it as a pay-as-you-go system. We didn't run it like an insurance company. The way an insurance company works is you, you gather premiums for everybody, you invest those premiums, and then when the claims come in, you pay out of those investments. And if you're really good at it, you actually generate equity and the value of the insurance company goes up. But a pay-as-you-go system, right? everybody puts into the pot and then everybody takes out of the pot later, as, as that working age population growth slows, what you ended up with is you know, when I turn... 65. I said, you know, not retiring because I can't retire. I mean, partly because okay. there won't be enough workers to support me because there will only be three workers for every retiree. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, two. And I used to say that that I was in trouble because that meant both my kids were going to pick my wife and she got all the entitlements and I didn't get any. <laughs> um, so I had to have another kid, which we did, but we haven't had a fourth. So I only got one guy who's going to have to keep me. Uh, and part God, of it is... <laughs> Yeah, and, and part of it is is there's is there's inflation in services, right? Look at the cost of healthcare. Look at healthcare uh, like things that we we consume in healthcare. You know the the famous twenty five dollar Advil or the you know the medical procedure. You know people's knee replacement is one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Like well. Maybe not everyone should get a knee replacement. I don't mean that in a, in a sinister way, but I'm just like, you know, there, there should be some calculation of utility and cost. And, and uh, you know, if you want to pay for it yourself, fine. Um, but, you know, does everybody have to have the most expensive treatments? And so that, here's the chart, right? Um, the, the inflation rate in those spaces which are linked to uh how should we say this nicely um corruption 
lobbying um, and and the opacity of it has created this massive spiral problem in that the cost of these entitlements, particularly the healthcare entitlements, keep rising and we don't have enough money to pay for it. Right. I, I think we talked about this before that my mom believes there's a little pot of money in Washington, D.C. called Judy's money. That, you know, she's put all this money in for all these years and she's 80, you know, one years old and she's going to get it back. I'm like, mom, there's no pot, right? My money goes to pay you and my kids' money will go to pay me and eventually that will run out. In fact, I think the Social Security Trust Fund literally does run dry in like 2035, 2036, something like that. But Social Security actually can be fixed. Social Security can absolutely be fixed. All we got to do is raise the retirement age. Right? Life expectancy now is in the late 70s, so we just got to raise the retirement age to the benefits age to, to there. And we can actually fix Social Security. Medicare, Medicaid, no chance. With this chart that you're showing, zero chance of fixing that. This chart is a bit of a doozy. This has been making the rounds uh, recently. I think this was put together about three or four years ago. Yeah, because it goes to December 2017. For those who aren't um, watching us on video here, just to describe everything, um, you're kind of looking at inflation uh, or price changes uh, between 1997 and 2017, so a period of 20 years, and they bucketed it into different categories. Um, you know, the things that have been the price categories that have inflated a lot are kind of in the red and up and to the right, and then there are. Um, a lot of uh, categories where price has stayed stagnant or even greatly decreased, especially if you're looking at TVs, right? Which the price has dropped basically like 95% of TVs. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know the the categories here that I want to highlight um, are hospital services, uh, college textbooks, and college tuition, uh, which are the three highest categories. Um, wages and housing, actually probably food and beverage too. So just to go through all of these, to to go back to what I was kind of saying at the beginning uh, of this podcast about growth. Um, if you look, honestly, you should. People should take a look at the GI Bill in general. It is really, really interesting. These were really effective policies that got put into place after uh, World War II. Uh, and if you go back even further, just look throughout history. Whenever there are these redistributions of wealth, they tend to focus on on pretty similar things, actually, because as it turns out, we're all humans and we all need relatively similar things to just That's advance right. our lives and also live, right? Um, healthcare tends to be a big part of that, but also education tends to be a big part of that. Uh, wages, obviously, housing, a place to live. Um, like you can, I've referenced this so many times um, uh, on various podcasts, but there's a book called Lessons of History. Um, and there's this, there's this section in the, there's a paragraph in the economic section where they're talking about a wealth redistribution that happened in Greece in like 600 uh, BC. And you could lit, it's just so similar to what's going on today. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in my opinion, again, just to draw it all back to, wealth inequality um and, and the idea that inflation is it's it's a, it's almost like an arbitrary bucket of things like think about what you spend your money on right and what do you need in order to advance your life in american society i gotta tell you education college tuition college textbooks those those are huge things you need a college degree to get a good job that might be changing but that's been true historically yeah. in the u.s for a long time and it's inflated 200 percent uh and it doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon although there Hospitals is one one little thing, Michael, that, 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 again, people don't, don't talk about it. It's kind of like everything where there's a gross and a net. You know, people talk about you know, gross returns when they should talk about net returns, right? They talk about the cost of investing when they should really talk about the net return that you make on your investment. You know, people say, oh, I want to minimize the cost. I'm like, no, why would you want to minimize the cost? You should want to actually maximize the costs of investments as long as they're incentive based meaning you pay incentive fees you pay more as you make more right you know i would gladly pay five percent fees if i could make 15 percent gross versus paying one percent fees to make eight percent gross i mean it's just not even it's not even a question um so the the gross versus net in because i'm sitting in south bend uh you know and and i've seen this right when i went to school here you know long long time ago right in the 80s uh, it was eleven thousand dollars a year, you know. Today, when my my kids went, which was ten years ago, uh, it was about fifty thousand dollars a year. Today, a student on campus is paying in the mid sixties, and when my little guy comes, he'll be the first member of the class at thirty three. Uh, it'll probably be close to a hundred thousand dollars, but that's the gross cost. The net cost to the average student is much much lower. And that's where all the big, you know, student 
uh, debt comes from. And that's a whole other story about who benefits from student debt. It's a whole another issue of, of the big lenders that, that make those loans. Uh, and that inflation is, is, is real. I mean, that hyperinflation on college campuses, but it's, there's so many kids that go to, especially the big fancy schools, uh, like Harvard, right? Harvard has this massive endowment and they actually spend a huge amount of the spending, uh, on scholarships, right? Same Princeton, same with others. If you have need, right, you don't pay anything. Now, the problem is for people in the middle, like the super, super rich, they can afford it. The poor get paid for. It's the people in the middle where $100,000 after tax is a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, you got to have a really big salary to, to cover that, or, or even if it's you know, 50 to 60 today versus 100 you know, in a few years. So I, I think the, the challenge is always thinking about the actual cost of things. Um, and sometimes this chart, I think, is misused in that way. I'm, you're not doing that, but, but I think some people do. No, it's uh, it's definitely possible. And, uh, you know, also for, for an interesting explanation um, of this as well, I, I would definitely recommend the Mark Andreessen interview that he did with uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy on Invest Like the Best, which came out uh, probably four or five months ago. Uh, so I'd take a deep look at that as well. Uh, but yeah, definitely good points, Mark. I want to I want to make sure that we get a chance to cover these inflation charts and then we can kind of move on to some of the stories. Um, but, uh, you know, in the same way that Jim Bianco inspired uh, a couple of the charts uh, in last week's roundup, uh, credit to Urian Timmerer, um, who is great. He's going to be coming on the mm -hmm. podcast soon uh, again. Uh, but he basically put together these three charts uh, on inflation. And one of the best things about Urian and his charts is that he just has such a great mind for history. Um, and I'll, I'll explain all three of these charts and how they're kind of related. Uh, and then Mark, we can kind of get your take here. So basically what you're looking at is he was just looking at um, expansionary periods throughout history, periods of economic expansion, um, what inflation, so measured by CPI, was doing, and then how different asset classes performed. In this case, we're highlighting commodities and the S&P. So if you're looking at this right now, different periods of uh, economic expansion, um, you, know, you can actually see, uh, I mean, one, one of the pretty interesting things, if you look all the way to the left of this chart, um, is April 2020, uh, which he identified as the start of a, of a, of a growth cycle uh, and what CPI is doing. You can start to see it creeping up. Um, and he actually made the comparison in this tweet thread that he did in between the period that we're in now and the 1940s. Um, Lynn Alban also has kind of made that same comparison. If you look at commodity prices during these expansions, Look, it's like commodities are right on cue. Again, if you look at the black line all the way at the left of this chart, uh, you see starting in April 2020, man, commodities really boomed. Um, in case, uh, for those of you who are saying, yeah, but maybe they topped out, historically, uh, there's actually, there could be a lot of room left to run, uh, basically, at least almost it looks like 2x based on this chart. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, we're looking at real S&P 500 performance during expansions. A couple things to note here. Uh, one of the economic... Uh, one of the periods that he identified June 2009 through February of 2020, just look at the length of that expansion. My God, uh, I think it's the longest, uh, I mean, it's the longest bull run uh, ever. Um, and now he's, you know, he's kind of also broken it out so that, again, all the way to the left of the chart, the black line, April of 2020, uh, we've gotten off to a pretty big start if this is another expansionary period. Um, I guess all three of these things together, Mark, do you have any takeaways or any patterns kind of jump out at you? Yeah, so a whole bunch of things. So one... Um, this, uh, period that we're in, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I almost cringe. I mean, literally almost physically cringe when, when someone refers to it as an expansionary period, it's money illusion, right? I mean, we, we are creating, uh, a huge problem and you're seeing it in the price of, of everything. Um, commodity prices, you know, it, it's not... That, that the commodities got better. It's not that right. the commodities, uh, you know, are doing something more. It's like college tuition, right? The, 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 the experience I had in the 80s versus the experience the kids are having today, yeah, they have fancier buildings, but the freshman chemistry class is pretty much the same. And uh, so it's, it's not worth five times more. It's that the money is worth less. And so this chart in particular that you've got up on the commodity prices, uh, the reason there's been such a sharp rise recently in, in commodity prices, most of that's oil, right, is because right. We, we created 
uh, through again these just historically, which are going to go look. We're going to read about this period uh, around the, the COVID crisis as maybe the dumbest set of decisions in the history of governments, uh, the lockdowns and what it meant in terms of of just crushing small business and and crushing the supply chain and and destroying um, you know commodity production companies. And now we're seeing the the other side of that, which is not only did we create scarcity problems, meaning there's not enough oil uh, to go around uh, because we put a bunch of companies in bankruptcy, but now we're we've devalued the currency so much that the pr- we, we always think about prices in our home currency. So we think about prices in dollars. And you know, I was in California um, for the Milken Conference and. Um, which is just a wild experience on a, on a whole bunch of levels. The, the, the highlight was being uh, called out on the street by someone who recognized me from, from Twitter for going into the den of vipers. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, I was like, well, you know, the only way to charm the snakes is to go into the den. So, um, but I, I think the, the challenge is that um, this period is historically different. And the idea that we're going to have a long expansionary boom because we hyper devalued our currency in the last 12 months, I think is folly. Yeah, it's I mean, I totally agree with you on the money illusion. That was, uh, you know, it's so non-intuitive to people because especially if you aren't in finance, I used to think of wealth in dollars. Like what else would wealth be other than dollars? Mm -hmm. And then you start to kind of learn about this stuff and you're like, well, it's not really dollars it's uh then you kind of start to think about money or currency as just another asset you know and you start to think about your wealth you know some of it belongs in dollars but then that changes relative to equities or bonds or real estate or whatever crypto or whatever else you're holding uh and it starts to just completely reframe your worldview um and honestly listening to guys like you and and pomp uh kind of talk about this the 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 important power of devaluing a currency um, and, and what that does to especially yeah. financial assets. Uh, it's just super powerful. Um, I want to end on this last uh, chart here, which is pretty interesting. Um, something that we don't uh, usually talk about, but just U.S. military spending in general. And for those of you who aren't following us on video, uh, you can see that the U.S. is basically half the entire world at uh, $778 billion. I, I will tell you I something... So I used to be... I was a, in college. I was a double major uh, psych and classics. And I, I tend to take these... Um, you know, kind of like biology uh, type classes back then. And something that I learned just about how animals uh, kind of structure themselves, like uh, animal uh, social structures, changed my Mm -hmm. mind on uh, U.S. military spending. And basically, if you look at uh, animals like gorillas or lions or whatever, uh, peace tends to come from one really dominant male. Uh, Usually it's Mm -hmm. male uh, in nature. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's this idea that if there's someone who's like big and bad enough, right, then generally people kind of don't challenge them. If it's just, if it's, there's an unchallenged leader, then there tends to be peace. And you can interpret that as being dystopian, whatever it is. It's a pattern that emerges in biology. It's a pattern that emerges in humanity in the form of empires. Um, So I used to think, ah, you know, you hear all this stuff. Why are we spending so much money on military spending? I don't know. Um, Those periods where there is a super dominant force, empire, uh, tend to be accompanied by peace. And you can look throughout history. There's the Pax Romana. uh, There's the Pax Britannia or Britannica or whatever it was. Uh, now mm-hmm. there's the Pax Americana, which might be, uh, you know, we might be seeing that transition. But, uh, might be fading. Might be fading. I don't know. But, uh, you know, these sorts of charts used to be like, why are we spending so much money on this? And now I'm kind of like, I don't know, man. Uh, if that's military budget is going to get spent, I'd rather the United States was spending it uh, than someone else. I don't know. What's well, your interpretation? But, but to your point, no, though, I, I, look, I think it, it's such a great insight. And, and I, I knew we, we were soulmates in that uh, you know, I'm a biology <laughs> and chemistry guy. And I'm all mm. about complex biological systems. Um, mm. yeah, I think everything from, you know, viral spreading, and I don't mean virus like coronavirus. I mean things when they go viral and, and they become popularized around the world or because uh, actually not all viruses are bad. Everyone, you know, remember we had a hashtag about that, you know, three plus years ago. You know, the virus is spreading, Pomp, and I would talk about that. Oh, yeah, it's such a horrible thing. Well, I actually read my paper. I wrote about there, there are good viruses in the world, um, viruses in our gut, et cetera. So, um, but, you know, complex, complex adaptive systems and, 
you know, if, if actually people are interested in this stuff, which they should be, they should go to Santa Fe Institute. There are just papers and papers and papers and on, on all kinds of stuff. Or read the book Complexity, uh, which is all about the history of the Santa Fe Institute and, and just some mm. really amazing thinkers in, in biology. Plus, the, the thing I think that you have that, that, that I wish I had done, and actually I forced my, my older son to do, is the classics or, or you know, what they call here the program of liberal studies. Because look, if, if you understand history, and you understand philosophy, you have such a leg up on life and and and, and you can actually be a, a, a good thinker, which is why I love doing this with you. But I, I think this chart is so interesting to me for a couple things. So one, 100% right. When there are when there is an empire, you know, when they have won and they've conquered everybody else. Now the conquering part, yeah, we whitewash that and history is written by the winners. So yep. uh, it's, it's, yep. it's not quite sometimes as as clear as as nice but but once it happens then there is this time of a peace and prosperity but the problem is as that peace and prosperity continues um the people in power decide well i'm just going to abuse my power and i'm going to go from capitalism to cronyism and i'm going to surround myself with my cronies and i'm going to overspend and you know the example i use all the time is is Afghanistan, right? Afghanistan, giant country in the desert, uh, not that populated, but it's definitely populated. There are definitely people there that we should think about. But the U.S. and 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 Russia have just taken turns over the last seventy five years occupying that territory. Now, it, the, the the example to me that, that that epitomized this was when Trump first took office. He fired a bunch of missiles into Syria, right? Didn't hit anything. I mean, it didn't hit anything. But, you know, and Russia had been in Syria, and, and, but it was $280 million into a bunch of people who, who made big political contributions. So I think you get this, the beginnings of it are really good. And then you get to the extreme, and it gets really bad. And it's really bad for the economy and bad for growth because you're siphoning money into un- unproductive uses. Because if there's nobody to fight against, what do you do with all these tanks and weapons? And the, the one thing I, I think that, that is interesting on that chart too is the next biggest is the next empire, right? China. Yeah. This is the Asian century. This, this, this story of she believes in the heaven's mandate. He believes that China is supposed to be number one. He believes that 1800 last 2000 years was right where China was on top. Yeah. America was an emerging market. And he doesn't want to destroy the rest of the world. That's not my point. But he believes through power. And it's not going to be military power, but cyber power and uh, community power. And it, you're already seeing it, right? And he's playing a yeah. very different game. It's why he's fighting against Bitcoin. It's why he has this plan to, to be number one in AI and 5G, complete dominance. Uh, it's a very interesting plan. So I think we're going to have to modify that chart going forward to what do people spend on military hardware plus infrastructure for tech. Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, the leading prime brokerage solution for all things digital assets, providing secure custody, trading, and financing to an institutional suite of clients. On the retail side of things, I am more than happy to make this endorsement because I have been a customer of Coinbase since the day that I got into crypto. I still keep the vast majority of my assets there actually, and I do it for one reason and one reason alone, so that I can sleep easy at night knowing that my funds are safe. It's the same reason when family or friends ask me, where should I buy my first Bitcoin? I direct them to Coinbase. And now, finally, when institutions are starting to ask, what's the most safe infrastructure to use? I only point them in one direction, to Coinbase Prime. And the reason that I do that is because it is peace of mind. When it comes to security, everything is top of the line on this platform, and it's a white glove experience to boot. They've been securing client assets at scale for eight years, which as of Q2 of this year is $180 billion. They have an industry leading insurance policy, and they're audited by Blue Chip auditors so that you can sleep easy at night too. So stop listening to me, click the link at the bottom of this episode, and go check them out for yourself. And when you get there, tell them that I sent you because I love to get credit. When it comes to crypto, security and custody is 
paramount. Introducing this episode's sponsor, Ledger, your secure gateway to buy, exchange, and grow your crypto assets. I know I've got a smart audience, so I'm assuming slash hoping that most of you already have your Ledger hardware wallet, but just in case you don't, this is how I think about it. I wouldn't get into a car if I couldn't wear a seatbelt, and I don't operate in crypto unless I can do it for my Ledger hardware wallet. Crypto is really exciting, but it is still the Wild West. There are lots of risks, and Ledger is the easiest way to make sure that you are still protected. And the best part about Ledger is that you don't need to make any trade-offs between security of your funds and utility of your assets because Ledger has Ledger Live, which is a software that syncs right up to your Ledger hardware wallet, and you can do anything that you'd want to do with your crypto assets. You can easily send and receive, you can buy and exchange, and you can get access to staking. And they've actually started to aggregate some of the best DeFi apps and services out there. Two of my favorites, Paraswap, a decentralized aggregator, and they've got Lido for staking. And stay tuned, I'm going to keep you guys updated. They've got some really cool services uh, coming out soon. Aave, Compound, and One Inch among them. So if you take one thing away from this, guys, please, please, please make sure that you're protected in this space. Get yourself a Ledger hardware wallet today and start using the Ledger Live app. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Thank me later. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, I hope you're right, by the way. Everyone always says that uh, it's going to be conflict is going to be cyber and it's probably not going to be some sort of kinetic war. Right. Right. You know, we've been fighting kinetic wars uh, as long as humans have been alive. So (laughs) I hope that we're at the end of that. Um, But also, you know, that's really betting against the trend. Um, But you did mention Bitcoin and I want to transition into our stories of the week. I want to talk about all these Bitcoin ETFs. So I was going to try to say at the beginning that we should try to go a whole show without saying the word Bitcoin. But I don't think we We can't this week. I don't even want to, man. It's uh, it's a, a cool week. You know, so we have the launch of the, uh, just to give everyone a summary, uh, so we had the launch of the futures-based uh, Bitcoin ETFs, I should say, because uh, ProShares launched their um, BitO, Bit0, I still BITO, uh, Bitcoin ETF, uh, broke records, uh, right? So it was like something like just under a billion uh, in terms of uh, trading volume on day one. Uh, they gathered 570 million in AUM. Day two, they actually, uh, no respite at all. It was like a 1.4 billion or something traded, and they gathered... 1.1 billion in assets under management. That's the largest, second largest uh, trading volume on day one, but it's the fastest uh, ETF to gather a billion dollars in AUM. Uh, I'm saying ETFs because today I'm pretty sure Valkyrie's uh, Bitcoin uh, ETF was supposed to launch. It was going to be under the ticker BTFD, which everyone thought was hilarious, except for the SEC. And apparently they have changed the ticker to BTF. Um, uh, and then it looks like Vanek is also launching on Monday. So we've got multiple uh, futures-based Bitcoin ETFs. And look, are they perfect financial products? No. Uh, we've talked about the rolled costs. Those mm-hmm. are known. But it's cool. Uh, I don't know. It What's your cool. take on everything that's gone on this week? Look, this was a historic week in in, in so many ways. I mean, one is mm. is this adoption of, of the ETF. Two, uh, you said the, just the massive uh, attention and volume and, and assets, right? Real assets. I mean, think about that. A billion dollars of of assets went into this thing. Uh, So, you know, this idea that, you know, I have my hashtag, right, probably a fad. Uh, You know, this is just not a fad, right? It's not going away. And do I love the futures products? No. I I, I think futures markets are very, very dangerous. Uh, When you can create paper, in air quotes, goods uh, out of thin air, uh, whether it's oil, whether it's gold, uh, or whether it's Bitcoin, it's just it has it's fraught with peril, right? And we can go deep down the rabbit hole of you know, of how gold prices have been manipulated since the uh, release of GLD, um, because what it does is those longs actually allow big banks to be short the other side. In fact, there was a rumor way back when, which I actually think is not a rumor; I think it's truth, that. Uh, GLD was held up for a long, long time. You know, everybody's like, why can't there be a gold ETF? Why can't there be a gold ETF? And the rumor was that, well, JP Morgan did not deign that it could be approved until they had enough uh, shorts on on the other side. And if you look at gold prices, you know, really since GLD has been uh, approved and you look at it relative to money creation, money supply creation, it's a massive disconnect. So something's been going on. Look, and com- companies in Europe have been fined billions of dollars for spoofing gold prices. You had oil in 2014. You had the big spike to 142 dollars. 
all caused by futures. Uh, and then you had the massive crash on the other side again, uh, because the big banks could squeeze these commodity uh, players. And there was the guy, the famous basketball player uh, in Oklahoma that, that basically got carried out on a stretcher. So I do worry. I mean, remember the last time um, we had a future story on Bitcoin was December 18th, 2017. Uh, that was the day that the mm -hmm. Bitcoin future CMB. launched. And uh, it was literally to the day, the peak uh, of the 20,000. And uh, we went down 84% from there. So I'm not saying that we're going down 84% from here. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I, I, I am nervous about uh, people taking the other side and and people like Michael Burry and others now being able to really get size on on the short side. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think people need to be cautious. This idea that futures are are better because they're not manipulated somehow is is just so silly. Right. I mean, yeah. And, and the idea that they're not approving a spot because the prices are manipulated. You mean different than GameStop and AMC and and myriad other stocks that are clearly manipulated. But what does manipulation even mean in a free and open market? If, if a player can engineer uh, a way to move the price, why is that manipulation? I, I, I don't understand. I mean, if somebody's doing something illegal or illicit or cheating, but just open market activity that everybody can see. I mean, there's full transparency in all this stuff. I don't, I don't really understand. Yeah. It's a funny thing. Um, I remember listening to a podcast back in 2017, 2018, Marco Santori, uh, at the time he was still at Cooley or something. Now he's at, uh, at Kraken. Um, but he was talking about basically the biggest impact on crypto market structure is going to be existing regulation. And uh, I think we're at a pretty funny point here because... The Bitcoin, the futures based ETF product is clearly, I don't think it's that controversial. It's a worse product than a spot ETF. And there's been lots of Twitter posts and threads, and you can go find that information outside of this podcast. But a spot ETF is kind of what we're all waiting for. And the, e and the SEC, to Gensler's kind of credit, they've got this checklist of different things, right? That they need to go down, like blah, blah, blah. You know, it's within the scope of investor protection. But basically, they just want transparency into the underlying spot market that the ETF is based on. And, you know, when you look at uh, stock-based ETFs, right, like, uh, you know, SPY and stuff like that, uh, QQQ for NASDAQ, that all trades in U.S. capital markets, right? Uh, that, that all trades domestically. You have perfect kind of insight into the exchanges, all that stuff. Well, guess what? Crypto is a global asset class by nature. Yeah. That presents a huge challenge to regulators. Like, they're just not set up. Um, you know, it, and I think at the end of the day, what's going to have to happen, it took me a while to come to this conclusion, they're going to have to adapt. They're going to have to adapt to that. Um, otherwise, they're just going to be left behind. Well, and they have they have adapted for global indices, right? There are global stock indices mm -hmm. and there are emerging market indices. And well, although I, I think it's comical, right, that that China is still considered an emerging market, or South they, Korea, it, what's it, or Taiwan. Is it MSCI? Is, still, is the main one? Yeah. Are they? And, is China in? That's crazy. China's in there. Yeah, just a little bit. And uh, but the one that get, that really gets me is South Korea. South Korea is not an emerging market. But why is South Korea still in the index? Well, because a bunch of people lobbied MSCI to keep it in because if it, they took it out, they'd have to give back a third of their assets because the index would shrink. Mm -hmm. So look, they, they will adapt. And it's like anything else. It's back to what are, we talk about incentives. What are the incentives for the regulators to approve things that make these markets more robust? Yeah. Well, they're not very high. Because who is on the other side? The traditional financial system. And the traditional financial system right now is vulnerable, right? It's, it's not as vulnerable as what's happening in China. I mean, China had real, real issues, right? They had $90 billion flood out of the banking system into Ant Financial and Alipay, and they shut that baby down, right? They just nipped that the bud. Because if your deposit base leaves, the banks have capital the requirements they become over leveraged and and then when you have bad debts it gets even worse and so you know china basically said look we can't have people draining money out of fiat into crypto that that's just going to cause uh, you know basically a run on the bank and 
So they, they, they've shut it down. Now, whether they really shut it down, whether they enforce it, you know, whether this ban's better than the 2013 ban or the 2017 ban, I actually think it is, I, I do. Um, but the US is, is in a similar situation. I mean, our banks are healthier than they were a decade ago because we bailed them out through QE, but they're not healthy. Uh, and if everyone started shifting capital out of the banking system into DeFi and crypto and, and, and this new financial system, um, you know, it, it gets dicey. So regulation has always been the tool that incumbents use to slow disruption. They can't stop disruption. Yep but they can slow it. So that kind of leads me uh, to my next story here. And I, I, I'm really curious to get your opinion here because you kind of led the charge. It, I, I don't know if this, but I'm pretty sure this is true, right? That you guys at Morgan Creek uh, were the first ones that gave pensions exposure to Bitcoin, uh, right? Through your fund, the Fairfax yep. County uh, pensions. Yep. Um, they are yep. joined today. Uh, the, this was kind of making the rounds that the Houston Firefighters Relief and Retirement Fund announced a Bitcoin and Ethereum purchase uh, as well. Really, really exciting news. Uh, so I guess what's your take uh, on, you know, is this kind of the beginning of a trend? You know, this smells, I'll just say, this smells like the beginning of the, the whole run-up in 2020. It's like when the Bit when Bitcoin is doing well, all these announcements, right? You see PIMCO, they're embracing mm -hmm. this news as well. Uh, Capital Group, right? One of the largest asset managers in the world. They're coming out saying, hey, we like this stuff again. Yep. It just smells like you got the trad buy coming out. Uh, there was a Bank of America report a couple of weeks ago. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to get too excited. No, What's Michael, it's, it's a great, it, it, again, great, great insight as always. And, and uh, I love your curation. I mean, it's amazing. Thanks. Um, you think about this. Uh, one of my friends, uh, there's a guy on Twitter, Larry Tentarelli, and, and we became friends on Twitter. And uh, it's actually, right? I mean, he had a real job in real life, but on, on nights and weekends, he, he would trade. And, and he's a, a pure momentum trader. Right, just mm. just price momentum, and there's a bunch of great sayings. You know, one of my favorites is Look, nothing good happens below the 200-day moving average. Just nothing mm. good, ever. So if you're below the 200-day moving average, there's just nothing good happens there. And it doesn't mean mm. you can't get back above it, which does happen, but underneath it, it's it's a bad place. Uh, but one of his other things he says, and I can't, he probably borrowed it from somebody, but the the news flow tends to happen in the direction of where you are relative to that 200 day moving average. So when you're well above the 200 day, you get positive news stories. And when you're below, you get negative news stories. Now, is it chicken and the egg? Which part is reflexive? Do you get more positive stories because the price is rising? Or do you get the price rising because there's positive stories? Um, you know, that's, that's a, uh, an interesting dynamic. And so if you think about where we are in the, the cycle, you know, I think we are at a, a really interesting uh, inflection point. I think there is reflexivity that's happening in the sense that, you know, each person's decision is impacting those other decisions. Um, and so, you know, look, we were fortunate you know, we had these visionary CIOs at Fairfax County, you know, give us capital for our, our first venture fund. Now our venture fund, 70% mm -hmm. of the money goes into, uh, equity of businesses, infrastructure, and 30% goes into liquid protocols. Now we still view them as venture investments, right? We bought Bitcoin, yeah, uh, they are, in, in, uh, as a, what we thought was a series B in 2018. We've held it ever since. Uh, that has today, uh, I think it's a 13x, 14x, which is a venture capital-like return, right? Not and, bad. And that's really good. And and so they definitely were the first pension to to own crypto. Now they didn't own it directly. The difference with with Houston, I actually tweeted at them, bravo with the with the fire emoji. I mean, I love the fact that this very creative and innovative CIO and a very courageous board is saying, you know what, we can't ignore this asset. We have to own it and we're going to own it directly. And I think it's the first of many. And, you know, there was also another pension, a shout out to, you know, some neighbors up north here of, of Indiana in Michigan. Uh, MERS actually committed to my friend Dan Tapiero's fund. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are a couple 
municipal nice. pensions. And I was just out at uh, a pension fund out in California pitching them for the second time. Uh, and I think they're going to come in. We just had um, a second municipal pension fund commit to our third venture fund. So it's it's happening. It's happening. Oh, great. But uh, yeah. I think the news flow occurs in the direction um, of the of the current trend, which, you know, I think that's a positive. Yep. Well, as uh, someone who is a, a co-founder of a news site, I uh, do have a little insight there. And I will tell you, I, I think there are two, two different things uh, to pay attention to there. One, the extension of this idea. So uh, Chris Dixon, Eddie Lazarin, two A16Z guys, they wrote this great piece. Everyone in crypto should read this, the price innovation cycle, the crypto price innovation cycle. Uh, it, they wrote it in like 2018, 2019, still very true today. Basically, it's this idea that everything kind of tracks price. Uh, and when the price starts to move, then it gets more positive media coverage, to your point. Mm -hmm. Attention starts to build. Uh, people move into the space, then more projects get started, more capital moves in, yada, yada. Then it all crashes, then it all kind of starts again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can look at this. And this is a non-intuitive thing people are less comfortable with, but everything tracks price. And I will say, I, I'm kind of torn because on the one hand, definitely more positive news comes out when Bitcoin is doing well. Attention is on it. People understand that. The marketers at these firms, like, we got to pounce while the, while the iron is hot, strike while the iron yeah. is hot. On the other hand, I will say, when price is not doing well, there was great news coming out. People just don't pay attention to it. And again, psychology major, on the matrix of things that people notice, and if they're positive, there's like this little four-part matrix you can look it up online. The top left corner, which is the positive stuff people tend to pay more attention to. It's a psychological bias that people tend to have. Of course. Look at Look at NYDIG. NYDIG, when Bitcoin was doing nothing, this I'll call them, shout them out here. They just had good news after good news, partnership locked in, bank doing this. Nobody cared. No, it didn't get any attention or traction. Yeah. People didn't notice it. But if like if if that had been during a price spike, it would have been front page, everyone tweeting about it. But they're just so shout out NYDIG to just for just consistently putting in great work. Uh, and the the price sensitivity when it's going up, people notice more positive stories and they get more sure. traction. And then I think companies will wait uh, to announce stuff when things are going well. So I think it's both yeah. things. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. The look, the, it's it's kind of like I always say it's about diaper ads, right? If you don't have kids, you don't see diaper ads. But there are diaper ads every day, in the newspaper, mm -hmm. online. There's there are, every day, there are diaper ads. But if you don't have a child that wear diapers, you don't see them. Uh, if you buy a new car, suddenly, everywhere, you see that car. If you have a Toyota, you see Toyotas. If you have a Kia, you see Kias. Uh, I bought a Kia. I was like, wait, everyone has Kias. No, no, where they all come from? <laughs> well, they all had them before. You just didn't see them because you were driving a, a Ford or whatever. So it's you're, you're absolutely right. The, 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 the biases are, are real. And, and look, there's also the problem of, of social media, which we don't have time to go into, but but there's the yeah. the again manipulation of your data feed, both positive and negative. They want to feed you positive stuff at certain times, and they want to feed you negative stuff at certain times, and and get you to believe a certain thing or feel a certain way. And uh, I mean, the algos are so good; it's scary now in that regard. Um, and so we all have to deal with that. And and look, that's been true forever the algos were just humans right editors choose what goes in a newspaper or not what goes in a magazine or not what goes on a website or not so it's not it's not that the algos are the big evil thing it's it's that the process of selective exposure or selective news or because you can't you can't consume everything and the part that i always i always marvel at right is and it happens on these these shows on friday is we can't talk about everything we want to talk about we can only talk about mm. certain things and you know sometimes you remember something or don't remember something but there's also a i i, I kind of like it it's a randomness of 10 things going on right now and you and i are talking about two or three but what if we talked about the other two or three would we go in a different direction or would we talk about so that that's kind of cool to to think about great all right we've got time for like one more story here and i want to get your opinion on the the raise that ftx did this week so FTX, Sam Bankman Freed, basically looks pretty unstoppable at this point. Uh, they raised four hundred and twenty million, sixty nine that six hundred ninety thousand dollars. So four twenty sixty nine. Uh, they raised it from sixty nine investors. First of all, I guess look twenty five billion dollar valuation. Congratulations, that's awesome. What is your take on that particular decision? The four twenty 
and the 69. It's like a meme, right? Uh, you know, we know yeah. what those numbers mean. What do you think about that? Look, I, I, you know what I'm going to say. I think it's stupid. I do. I know what you're going to say. I, yeah, do. I, just, yeah. I, just think, I just think it's stupid, right? And But but here's the thing. Um, no, I'm not even going to come up with a, a, a good rationalization for it. I, I think people who meme this stuff, I, I know some other people that do it, um, I, I just think it's stupid. I think it's... It's like, did people not pay attention to you in high school? And, and so you're trying to get even? I, I just don't understand it. it. Now, look, he's way more successful than me. And, and I think he is executing flawlessly. Uh, but I, I think that's just dumb. And hmm. I guess it goes back to P.T. Barnum, right? All publicity is good publicity. So why yeah. would you do something that is sexist, clearly sexist and, and wrong hmm. and just not for proper discussion circles. Um, that just doesn't make sense. You're supposed to be running a business. And, you know, why do you want to tell people you get high? I, I just don't get that. Why Why is that so cool? You want to do, you want to do that in your, your own time? I don't care what you do. But, I don't know, tying it to the business? I don't know. Seems great. I, I, I much prefer what he did with Tom Brady and Giselle. I mean, let's get in. Let's get everybody involved. Let's get let's cool let's get cool people engaged and let's let's build something great. But why do you need to appeal to I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. I'm just showing that so I'm all offer that's all. I, I was gonna say slightly different uh, generational perspective here. I think I, I, for, for the record, I have nothing but respect for SBF and FTX. It isn't a decision I would personally make because I'd be worried on the other side of whatever uh, market environment we're in right now that this would look like a bad decision in hindsight. That being said, we're talking about it, right? And I'm sure that that's, uh, that was course. the idea at the end of the day yeah. is that it's, it's just a really good way to get free publicity. And I think for a younger generation, those words like 42069, those obviously have direct implications about things. I think people don't even people have disassociated they just think it's something funny at this point i think for a young they, you don't, they don't even necessarily think about what the thing is referring to it's more just like a badge that says like hey this is like funny and cool and I, I i'm not defending it in any particular way or another i just uh, michael what it reminds me of and look look said i i have nothing but admiration and respect for for what those guys are building uh but it does remind me the back in 2000 the peak of the craziness there was this commercial and all you saw was the table and underneath you saw, you know, feet and legs. Uh, you saw wingtips and high heels. And, and then you hear click, 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 like someone walking across the floor. And you see a pair of red tennis shoes and it says, oh, welcome, Mr. Chairman. That was never a good idea, right? Most of those companies went bust. And it's, to me, that decision smacks of irresponsibility and um, and just, uh, it's juvenile and I don't want a juvenile in charge of a, of a big business. I want, I want an adult in the room and I want someone who is thinking how they can, you know, make the company better. Not how can I appeal to a bunch of my, my buddies from, from high school. That just, that's just me. Yeah. Yeah. I think, look, it's probably more, more than anything, like to that, uh, that example of the commercial, it's probably more of a, a reflection of where we are in the current cycle. And what I would say is, like, I don't think Sam's honestly at risk of this, but like, I would always be pretty concerned. I, you, no one wants to be a poster child of, of a certain era, right, in almost any regard. Uh, so I guess that's what I would leave it at. Congrats, uh, Sam. I'm rooting for you here, man. <laughs> that, that's I, awesome. I, look, I, hey, uh, look, I, I, I'm, 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 we're invested. And um, mm -hmm. not in these rounds, but but we have some investments, and and now mm -hmm. we're up a lot on those investments, and and that's that makes me happy. But I think you did just paint a big target on yourself, just like yeah. another famous person did. But we'll see. Right, and look, uh, this is unsubstantiated, right? But there has been things on Twitter, right? The 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 reason the Valkyrie ETF is supposed to go live earlier this week, uh, why it might have not gotten approved till today is because the F SEC didn't like the ticker BTFD. Everyone thought it was funny. Uh, they got a lot of props. But guess what? At the end of the day, you know, the old people in charge don't like that kind of stuff. And, you yeah. know, there's probably good reason for that, too. End of day. Um, mm -hmm. There needs to be some semblance. There's a place for jokes and maybe there's a place. Yeah. <laughs> not well, I mean, why not? Why not? Know. Why not just BTD? Why not just buy the dip? I mean, do you have to have the f bomb? You don't, and and I, I agree with you, right? I mean, it, I use the term, 
BTFD. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I do, but, mm-hmm. but actually I probably use it not very often and I probably say buy the dip more and, um, but it's okay. okay. Just, it's right. a, it is a well, generational thing. It is a generational thing. Yeah, I think so too. Maybe a market cycle thing. Anyway, Mark, uh, we've already gone over here a little bit, but this was a ton of fun. Thanks for calling in from South Bend. Enjoy the game, my friend. Uh, I'm you. not really up on Thank you. the sports, but uh, I'm, I'm rooting for you. Whoever you're pulling uh, for, it's I'm just, it's, for just it's, it's our rival. We're playing USC this weekend, and it's just it's always fun. So have a good one. Thanks for having me, and uh, we'll do it again next week. You as well. See you soon. Bye.